I'm in Chile, yeah. in Patagonia. They have textures. In a notophagus forest, cool temperate rainforest. As you can see from my clothes, it's quite cool. We're here with a group of international mycologists who have been invited here by the Fungi Foundation of Chile. The fungi here is fabulous. There's fungi everywhere, just dotted all along the path. There's terrific fungi, including this one, which is a Cortinarius. Look at this beauty. It's a Mitrilla or Ostromitrilla. We're not sure. We've been finding it everywhere. We're not even sure it's described. Do you get groups of it that are more dense? No, no. they're normally by themselves. No. If you want to take a good picture of it, it would be great, and then we'd collect it, put it into a herbarium. They're difficult to photograph. <laughs> My name's Juliana Furci. I am the executive director of Fundación Fungi, or the Fungi Foundation. That's the only NGO that works exclusively on fungi in the world. This sitaria yeah. is extremely important to the native people. They would call this the bread of the Indians. They would collect these and um, because of their high sugar content, they would eat them through most of spring and summer. When I was 19, I discovered fungi and there were no books and there was nowhere to study mycology in Chile. So I started studying myself and said, I'm going to write this book and wrote a first field guide then decided to keep on documenting fungal diversity in Chile. And that's how the Fungi Foundation was uh, created. It's an NGO that works on the research, conservation and promotion of fungi in Chile and the world. Um, we've managed to um, trigger the inclusion of fungi in Chilean environmental law at the highest legislative level. What that means is that if you want to do a large housing development, build a dam, build a highway, not only does Chile evaluate impacts on flora and fauna, but also on fungi. And we're the only country in the world that does that. This, we've been seeing this here. It's an ascomycete, and it's a very curious thing. It's a huge amount of it. My name is Don Feaster, and I'm at the Farlow Herbarium, which is one of the units of Harvard University. And it's a collection that includes about 500,000 fungi. I'm a professor in the Department of Organismic and Evolutionary Biology at Harvard, and I've been there a long time. <laughs> I study these cup fungi, so in general I'm looking for those, um, but also anything that seems to be odd and unusual. And there are many of them, but it's the odd and the unusual that always attract me. Years ago, I was given a diary uh, that was written by a Harvard botanist who traveled in this part of the country in 1905, 1906. He had described all these wonderful fungi. So as soon as I read this, I thought, I've got to get there to do collecting. And we found some of the same things that he had found. Uh, but then we realized that uh, this is really exceptional uh, collecting here and the, both the diversity and what the stories are of how you can connect this with other parts of the world. It's one thing to describe and know the organism because of what it looks like, but it's another thing to know and to try to figure out how it's really working in the environment. What's its relationship to the other organisms there? Look at this beauty. Oh, well, I should be able to get down below that. Yeah. Those are very nice cortinarius. Fungi are like the egg in the cake. If you're going to make a cake and you have flour and you have sugar, um, those ingredients don't stick together unless you put egg in them. In a forest, plants and animals don't connect unless there are fungi. No tree can live outside water without fungi. No plant on earth can synthesize the nutrients from the soil that they need without the help of fungi. When life emerged from an aquatic e ecosystem onto land, uh, it was possible for plants to do it because of these fungi. What's happening there is that the fungi are giving the trees nutrients like phosphorus, magnesium, water. They're extending the area, the 
area of water from which plants are absorbing their nutrients and the plants are giving the fungus sugars that they produce in the foliage through photosynthesis and basically without fungi no bread no beer no wine no cheese no yogurt no chocolate no soy sauce and no forests without forest no oxygen you know no environment as we know it so currently we are looking at cordinarius which is a gilled fungi and it has brown spores these this genus is really really common in north of Vegas forests it's the most dominant mushroom forming fungus genus you can find here and my estimation is that in Patagonia in Tierra del Fuego you probably find 200 300 species of cordinarius mm. so it's like really really diverse and uh, I'm trying to <laughs> find out how many species there are and what are the names of the species and which of the species are new to science. I'm Tuula Niskanen. I'm originally from Finland, but I'm uh, currently working in Kew Royal Botanic Gardens in London, in, in UK. I'm a mycologist. I do taxonomy of fungi, so I study the diversity and uh, distribution and evolution of fungi and I'm specialized to gilt fungi, agricales and especially this genus Cortinarius. Even in Europe, even in well-studied areas, you can still find fungi that are new to science. So just like a small fraction of uh, fungal diversity has been described to date. Let's say there are maybe 200,000 species described we don't know what is the total diversity of fungi. We Some estimations say that it's probably 5 million globally. So that gives you probably some estimation of how much work there is still to be done. And then of course we are giving more attention to fungi that are forming mushrooms. Things we can see, but there are also a lot of fungi that grow just underground and they never produce any fruiting bodies. And those are, those are even less known. My name is Dr. Ali Mujic, and I am a mycologist who studies truffles, in particular ectomycorrhizal truffles. And what I'm looking for today are truffles that are growing in a mycorrhizal or symbiotic association with these Nothofagus pumilio. To find truffles, normally we would look for an animal that can smell them because they're mushrooms that have adapted to use the smell that they can emit to attract animals and use that as a dispersal mechanism. Other mushrooms will disperse their spores into the wind and they're above ground. Truffles are below ground and we rely on a pig or a dog that can smell them to find those truffles underground. Without a pig or a dog we have to use a little bit of intuition. They can be quite small and some of them can be as small as a, a few millimeters across variously colored from brown to white to purple to brown, black. Ah, This is a little species in the genus Thaxtrogaster. It's really closely related to Cortinarius, which is one of the most common ectomycorrhizal above ground mushrooms we get here. So closely related, in fact, that we've now discovered, uh, looking at the genetics of these fungi, they are Cortinarius. This habit, this habit of fruiting underground and relying on animals to dig them up like we're seeing here, has evolved multiple times in a lot of groups. They've all independently found a way to produce this truffle-like fruiting body. But what a nice find. Sometimes you get a few fruiting in the area, sometimes you get just one. Oh yeah, here's another. So just poking that up out of the soil. This is cool. I think we have seen this species already. This is Thaxtrogaster. I had been walking over these for years. For years and years I'd been out in the forest collecting fungi. And then all of a sudden I learned that I was missing half the story. There were all these fungi fruiting underground. And I got interested in fungi in the first place because they were mysterious to me. And when I learned there was something even more mysterious, it's hiding underground that you have to really, really look for and it's so specialized, boy, I was hooked. In terms of the ecology of these forests, it's not just a, a casual food source. During certain times of the year, these truffles are the primary food source for a lot of small mammals. And it became a real issue of conservation concern in the Pacific Northwest where I'm from 
because a lot of the animals that were eating these are endangered, and it's their primary food, many of these truffles are old growth specific. So if you cut down the old growth, you're losing habitat for their preferred food source. So when we get back from the field, each collection is assigned a number. There's one person photographing, another person at the microscope, somebody writing the data into a computer. We also then proceed to dry the mushrooms. The drying is important because that's the way mushrooms are stored in fungariums and that's what we do for hours after the field. It takes longer than it does to collect them. Amazing in a way that we can come out every day and find things that we don't know that the diversity is so great that we just end up um, finding things new and different at each turn. And that's part of the reason I love to do mycology. <laughs> we believe that there's nothing cooler than fungi in the world. And anybody who doesn't know that will know it soon because of the work we're doing.